So my name is Rosalind Picard. I uh, am co-teaching a course with Sherry Turkle, Cynthia Brazil, and Rana El Kaliubi on autism theory and technology. And this is, uh, it's our honor and privilege to have Este here with us today. Este uh, founded and is executive director and curator of the Autism Acceptance Project. I put the URLs on the board for the project and there's some brochures in the back as well. And she is the mother of an autistic son as well as has a uh, Masters of Fine Arts and a, quite a track record in writing articles uh, both about autism and about art and is um, in particular I'm very fond of her blog The Joy of Autism which I've put the URL up here also I, I think what you'll find in her approach is just an incredible positive and inspiring and uh, hopeful uh, set of ideas and, and writing I, I certainly feel that way every time I, I visit the site so it's a real honor and a privilege to have you here looking forward to what you have to say for all of us Can you hear me? I'm waiting for my cue, thanks. Um, first, let me uh, say that it's an honor to be here today. Thank you very much to Rana and Roz for inviting me here. Um, but I must say, after reviewing the course syllabus, I should probably be here, uh, be a student here and not a lecture, lecturer today. So actually, looking at your labs, I'd love to spend some more time there. So today I won't be talking about mirror neurons or abnormal development of brain connections or embodied cognition. All I am is a mom of, of an autistic child and I feel passionately about him. So let me begin there. Our personal journey living with autism. This is Adam. He is about three years old in this picture. Uh, Adam, when he was born, he was a very sensitive child, excuse me. When he was born, his eyes were wide open, darting around the room, and he didn't sleep much for 36 hours, the 36 hours we spent in the hospital. Uh, he was a very happy baby. He could imitate me, and at three months, he could already, already say, hello, in a me melodic and echoic way. At that time, he was very sensitive to noise, and it took me about three hours to get him down in the night. And once he did, he was up about every hour or, or hour and a half. Uh, and for about the first three years of life. He doesn't have those issues as much anymore. Car rides when he was, he was a baby were particularly disastrous. Uh, it led me to buy my first sexy minivan uh, so he could peer out of the window and watch DVDs, but he doesn't have those issues anymore either. Uh, by 11 months, he knew his alphabet and his numbers up to 10. Henry thought, my husband thought he was a genius. He said, I've never seen anything like it before, and he should know he has four other children. He tested Adam's skills at identifying numbers and letters randomly before Adam could even walk. After we concluded Adam's first birthday party, where he seemed to ignore the guests and preferred watching the sound of music throughout the festivities, and while Adam outlined the sharp shadows cast on our living room floor by the four o'clock sun with his hands, when the house quieted, my husband's tone had changed. I think there's something wrong, he said, to which I angrily replied, there is nothing wrong with my child. Little did I know that, despite all the doubts since then, and sometimes even now, I would come to think the same way about Adam three and a half years later. While Adam has challenges that he works hard to overcome, there is certainly nothing wrong with him. It took us until Adam was about 18 months of age when we obtained the official autism diagnosis. It was the day I will never forget. Some call it D-Day or Diagnosis Day. The diagnosis changes the pace of time and the shape of dreams. Doctors, newspaper articles all about autism were beginning to form an imposed identity for my child despite the fact that he had never changed. Only our perceptions of him had. While it scared and confused me at first, it also made me a little angry. All of this talk and urgency was distressing. I was working against the joy I felt from my child, thinking I had to work to beat his autism against the clock. We all hear in the media that early intervention is key, right? In retrospect, the focus quickly swept away from enjoying the day today to changing Adam so he could have a future. 
Canadian doctors and the, th the therapist that I had hired viewed Adam like a pathological specimen. Now, I consider I may have been an overly sensitive mom at the time, and I think I still am. But this is why I'm Adam's mom. Protecting Adam from harm is an instinct, and I consider that protecting his self-esteem is paramount. Reading the work executed by scientists at the time, and now today too, is discouraging. So many theories that didn't seem to measure against my Adam. Was this what I had to look forward to? A constant pummeling of what Adam wasn't? Or what he would never become? It was when I turned to the work by autistic people that our lives really began to change. Autistic people began to reveal not the cold, hard scientific theories, many of them unfounded, but began to humanize autism. I went to meet autistic adults, read their writings, and I viewed their artwork. Well, I saw the, a difference in the way autistic people moved or responded to me or even their surroundings. I also saw the one overriding trait that we all share, a desire to be part of something and a profound understanding of the world and how society views them as, autist as autistic people. What continues to be apparent is the disconnect between who autistic people really are against the dehumanizing and devastating language which is used regularly in representing autism at all levels of society. I really wanted to be part of this autism community, to be alongside other parents and autistic adults and children. So back in 2005, I became the corporate chair of the National Alliance for Autism Research, which is otherwise known as NAR, or was NAR. And as you may know, it merged later with Autism Speaks. I noticed the language that was used to describe autism and autistic people when I was waiting to deliver my speech at a NAR luncheon. The mothers who preceded me were talking about having lost their child. They were crying, weeping literally on stage while reading their poems. Now, I didn't feel this way about Adam, although I understand the effect of lost dreams. I thought that my joining this group of fellow autism parents, I would be celebrating my son and raising awareness about autism in terms of his dignity and his being while embracing together the challenges. In their pleas to cure autism on stage, I felt that the autistic children for which we were rallying were only half there, that this quest to beat autism made our children only half alive. In fact, I didn't feel like we were there for autistic people at all. We were there for the parents. So I followed them on stage, nevertheless, to describe the beauty of my son. And I quoted Paul Collins. He's a fellow uh, parent of an autistic child. He wrote a wonderful book called Not Even Wrong, Adventures in Autism. And this is what I quoted. Autists are described by others and by themselves, he says, as aliens among humans. But there's an irony to this, for precisely the opposite is true. They are us, and to understand them is to begin to understand what it means to be human. Think of it. A disability is usually defined in terms of what is missing. A child tugs at his or her parents and whispers, where's that man's arm? But autism is an ability and a disability. It is as much about what is abundant as is what is missing, an overexpression of the very traits that make our species unique. Other animals are social, but 